the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology, which is a member organization of SynBioWatch, which is bringing you the East Bay Conversations, this series. SynBioWatch with the lovely banner that we have that was made by Ella Choi of uh, Movement Generation. Thank you, Ella. Um, so we're bringing you the series, um, East Bay Conversations, The Promises and Perils of Biotechnology, and tonight's very special guest, Shannon Nashiva. Yay. <laughs> now, uh, SymbioWatch, just for those of you who don't know, is dedicated in part to raising awareness about some very highly consequential social effects of uh, emerging biotechnologies. And uh, earlier this year, we put on a conversation about synthetic biology, which is also referred to as extreme genetic engineering. And uh, we also put on another one on human genetic engineering and inheritable genetic modification. You can catch those. They're archived. They're on the website. You can see them if you miss them. Um, next year, we're hoping to bring you uh, a conversation on reproductive technologies, especially um, human egg harvesting, this fracking of women's bodies for uh, bio research. So you can uh, visit the SynBioWatch.org website for more information about these things. And importantly, you can also visit the websites, knock it off, Jeff. You can, <laughs> you can, <laughs> you can also visit the websites of the uh, member organizations because they have very rich, wonderful websites. Now, um, <clears throat> to keep bringing you this wonderful information and to keep it in the town square to broad audiences, we need your help. So we are going to literally pass the hat here, <laughs> and we have we have representatives from four of the uh, coalition members of SynBioWatch. So these representatives are from uh, Movement Generation, <laughs> Friends of the Earth, <laughs> Center for Genetics and Society, and Alliance for Humane Biotechnology. All right, so they're going to start at the back and pass the hat, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, with your contributions, we'll be able to bring you more special guests and give you more information. And we also want to give a special thanks to the CS Fund, who helped us get us start, our start with this conversation series. Now, um, one aspect of emerging biotechnology that's very relevant for the East Bay, and that connects things up between uh, regional developments and global developments is this concept, this idea, this collaboration that's, re that's referred to as the East Bay Green Corridor. The East Bay Green Corridor. And from its promotional website, what we know about the East Bay Green Corridor is that it's a collaboration between the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and UC Berkeley and other regional educational institutions and the civic leaders of most many East Bay cities. And uh, its mission is to create, and this is a quote, a thriving region of green technology innovation, commercialization, and economic development that generates high quality jobs and meets environmental and social goals. And that certainly sounds good. But there's also some greenwashing that's going on. Surprise, I know. Um, <laughs> Um, there are, in addition to promoting things like solar power, there are also less obvious initiatives that are part of the East Bay Green Corridor, such as the seeding of biolabs throughout the region that will be doing controversial uh, research and development, synthetic biology, also known as extreme genetic engineering. And this will be going on without broad public awareness and in advance of uh, regulations to deal with it. And it's a promotion that will grease the wheels for corporate welfare, for high-tech false solutions to social problems. And it also promotes um, a bioeconomy that fuels local and global land grabs and social disruptions, which you'll be hearing about tonight. Hello. <laughs> Is that okay, John? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to cover as much as we can tonight, but we're also going to 
our hope that you come back and join us in a little over a month's time on October 16th, uh, where we're going to have a conversation on biosafety by the bay, communities and workers at risk. So do come back for that. It hooks up very nicely with this one, and you really need to know about this. Okay. Now, tonight's uh, interviewer is Gopal Dayani. Um, <laughs> generation. And uh, Gopal has been working tirelessly since uh, the 1980s for social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. I think many of you know him here tonight. So without further ado and with great appreciation, I turn the evening over to Gopal. I kind of like pretending that you all came to hear me speak. <laughs> Installment of the East Bay Conversations on the Promises and Perils of Biotechnology. Um, I just want to say, I want to start with a little bit of framing about why we've been doing this and, um, and what this specific conversation is going to be about. The series was developed to expose what has become the big plan for the post oil economy, um, and they call it the bioeconomy. And uh, you might think that the bioeconomy would mean something about uh, an economy based on life, um, but of course it is not. It's an economy based on control, manipulation, and commodification of life. To degrade living systems to the level of a production platform and give globalized industrial production more room to grow. To grow into the space of living systems from the microbial on up. Some of what you hear us talk about when we talk about the bioeconomy Things like microbial factories that, um, that will produce industrially useful products. Um, that will make fuels and pharmaceuticals, seeds, and now even species, they claim. A sugar economy where everything we depend on oil for will get from, sh from sugar. <coughs> from cane and corn. And eventually from cellulose, from the woody parts of plants. And we're going to get all that without missing a beat. It'll be the new platform for industrial civilization. Now, it sounds like sci-fi, but it's here and now. But it's important to remember that just because it's here and now doesn't mean it's true. Doesn't mean they can fulfill the promises that they make. That they'll break, they'll break, us, break the oil addiction. That they'll cure cancer. That the blind will see. That our streets will be lit with the bright lights of glowing trees. But actually, it doesn't matter whether they can do it or not, because there is an enormous amount of damage to be done simply through the speculation. And that is what we are living through now. Solazine in uh, South San Francisco made the most expensive jet fuel on the planet from synthetically engineered or manipulated algae, and sold it to the US military for something on the order of 450 bucks a gallon. And they are about to build a 5 million square foot lab in Richmond that will bring together the Joint Bioenergy Institute, the Joint Genome Project, the Life, Sci Life Sciences Division of the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, Carbon Cycle 2.0, and a commercialization infrastructure to make sure that our public dollars fuel science for corporate profit. So the damage is being done, and it's being done north and south. It's being done through gentrification and land grabs, as Tina mentioned. I have something to show you real quick before we start. This is called the National Bioeconomy Blueprint. Uh, raise your hand if you've had a chance to see the National Bioeconomy Blueprint. Yeah, so this is from April 2012. Um, I wish I could say it was from April 1st, 2012. That would be just so appropriate. But it's not. It's from April 2012. Um, and this was, um, this was the study on the bioeconomy um, uh, commissioned by the White House. And um, interestingly enough, um, 
the lead author of this is now working for, um, for uh, the University of California and Berkeley National Labs to help with the commercialization of um, the commercialization center that's going to be in the new life sciences division. Um, but it's important to uh, just read a quick piece of this. The bioeconomy has emerged as Obama administration's priority because of its tremendous potential for growth, as well as the many other societal benefits it offers. It can allow Americans to live longer, healthier lives, reduce our dependence on oil, address key environmental challenges, transform manufacturing processes, and increase the productivity and scope of the agricultural sector while growing new jobs and industry. Obviously, there is one very honest thing about this. Only Americans get to live longer. <laughs> so in 20, just so you have a sense of the scale, really quickly, in 2010, the bioeconomy was $76 billion in revenue from agriculture and another $100 billion in revenue from fuel and materials and plastics and other, um, other products. Um, so, a major piston of the engine of the bioeconomy is right here. We are at the epicenter. We are ground zero for the bioeconomy. And it's the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and all of the companies that have been spin off from it. And one of the chief architects of this is a guy named Jay Kiesling, who runs the Joint Bioenergy Institute, will be a major uh, head of the lab, and has spun off a number of companies locally um, to do um, synthetic biology and bioeconomy-derived materials. So today we're going to try and connect the dots from the biotech industry, from the impacts in the Global South, the development here in the Bay. And uh, Dr. Shiva, who does not need any introduction, is in a unique specific, uh, position to speak to the topic of seeding labs and seeding seeds, the impacts of the biotech bonanza. Because she is not only one of the most vocal advocates for small farmers and agroecology on the planet, and a leader of Earth democracy, but is herself a scientist. She has been in the fields with farmers and in the labs with scientists. She has been in, excuse me, she is no stranger to the techno fix, the idea that technology will save us. But she is also no stranger to the other techno fix, that traditional ecological knowledge is the key to our collective resilience. Her writing, um, uh, most of you raise your hand if you read her writing on a regular basis. Very good. Raise your hand even if you don't. I want to just point out a few things. Um, uh, she, it's prolific, the career, but um, democratizing biology, reinventing biology from a feminist, ecological, and third world perspective, and more recently, soil, not oil, staying alive, and this year, making peace on the earth. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shiva, who's going to speak for a little bit on the, on the themes that we've raised, and then we're going to engage in some question and answer and conversation. Thank you very much. I think they have all these wires, I'm going to not talk. Okay. So it's a pleasure to be here um, because one of my first trips um, on ecological issues was to England for Friends of the Earth. That's when I first met Dave Brower. Um, because I'm remembering that the two other people who were with me, Jose Lutzenberg of Brazil for Latin America and Wangari Maathai for Africa, and I was there for Asia to launch the Tropical Rainforest Movement. Um, and uh, are no more with us. And some of these amazing pioneers have left such a legacy, which is why we are in a building um, in his memory. So I'd like to first to just thank them for what they gave us. Um, also, my dear, dear friend, Jerry, we've done so much together. And the foundations that were laid for a global citizens movement in time of globalization, where corporations thought they would unite and citizens would be divided, changed the history. Seattle changed things including launching a new militarization 
against movements, but we'll find ways to deal with that. <laughs> Ignatius Chapella. So, among, among the best of scientists that I know, but also among the most courageous scientists I know. And he brought to Berkeley the tradition of Satyagraha. It's the only thing that will work in our times. Satyagraha means the force of truth, the fight for truth. Gandhi taught it to us. And any movement that has to make a difference today will have to be a Satyagraha, a fight for truth and fight for people's rights and the rights of the earth. Now, I should never have been involved in agriculture. It was never my intention. I thought I'd have a comfortable life with quantum theory. <laughs> Quanta are thoroughly unpredictable, but much more predictable than the world that has been created around the term green. And I started to work on agriculture because of, uh, of the violence of the Green Revolution in 84. 30,000 people were killed in Punjab, the land of the Green Revolution, which had been given a Nobel Peace Prize. 3,000 were killed in one night in Bhopal, same year, 1984. 30,000 and more have died since then. Children are still being born, maimed, crippled. Bhopal hasn't had justice yet, so... When I think of all the stuff going on, on chemical warfare and 200 children dead, I think of the chemical warfare that started with chemical agriculture, and actually started in the concentration camps, continued in chemical agriculture, and is by various names carrying on in, under the label green. Now to me, this is green. What was done to Punjab could be more appropriately named the brown revolution in terms of desertifying a fertile land, or a red revolution in terms of shedding blood. There was nothing green about it. So my first issue with the uh, green washing and appropriation of green is it involves very deep color blindness. It also confuses peace with war. You know, Norman Borlaug was given a Nobel Peace Prize for something that has left India devastated, especially the land of Punjab, where the Green Revolution package was first introduced. Now, they always cite science as the basis of what's being done. But if you look at the language of what is, of how Green Revolution was introduced, Borlaug talked about miracle seeds. He didn't talk about scientific seeds, he talked about miracle seeds. He didn't talk about 12 students, he talked about his 12 wheat apostles. Who had 12 apostles? You remember? It was somebody else. <laughs> Worse, you know, they've suddenly found a young man called Mark Linus, who's constantly sent up around the world. Um, he came recently to India, and they create platforms for themselves, you know? The governments that want to promote this, the public relations people like Mark Linus were sent around. He actually gave a talk where he, he quoted from the Gita. You know, in the Gita, Krishna says, when the world will be in disarray, I will come as a carnation, incarnation again and again and again. And Mark Linus talks about Norman Borlaug as an incarnation. So they are not just colorblind, they are all also very blind about reality because they mix up a bad science with a religious mantle. There's nothing scientific about what happened in the Green Revolution. There's nothing scientific about what's happening with biotech. And there's nothing scientific about what Kiesling, uh, Kiesling is his name, right? Yeah, Jay Kiesling. And the other guy, Craig Winter. <laughs> you know, no matter what.
what you look at, they just hog the money. Now this guy knew nothing about the human genome, but he patented it. <laughs> Kingsling knows nothing about plants. I've debated him. He doesn't know about fields, farms, biodiversity. All he knows is how to write proposal to get public money. And it's not that they write good proposals, it's already fixed that they'll get the money. It is a privatization of public goods at every level. The Green Revolution is still cited as something that brought India from a ship to mouth existence. When the violence broke out in Punjab, I wanted to understand something that was about peace has left violence. What was it? I knew nothing about the Green Revolution. In the days when it was being launched, I was busy training myself as a physicist. I found first that India didn't choose it. It was forced to adopt it. That we'd had a drought, we had to import a little more wheat. We were told we can't get wheat if we don't change Indian agriculture. And our prime minister of that time, Lal Bahadur Shastri, refused. He said, I'm not going to experiment with such a large country with so many small farmers. We'll set up a small experiment and see if it works. Lal Bahadur Shastri died mysteriously in Tashkent. The pressure continued. And the pr kind of pressure that's being brought on GMOs and biotech happened then. World Bank joined with USA, joined with Ford, joined with Rockefeller. They were the biggies. Now it's Gates. You know, Rockefeller and Ford are small players <clears throat> compared to Bill Gates, who wants to bring the alliance, who, who wants to bring the Green Revolution to Africa through the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. And you should see the language that's being used. Africa having no knowledge. Africa having no seeds. Africa has given us all so many of the plants we grow. The millets came to us from Africa. So many of the dars, the pigeon peas. Well, even humanity. Isn't it Lucy was a bird? <laughs> but that's part of the problem. It's not just about color blindness. It's about blindness to the sources of what makes things happen. That is why you can have all of this new biotechnology linked to intellectual property rights and patenting. But what do they patent? They patent millennia of evolution, centuries of breeding by farmers, take something that has existed, put a toxic gene and say, my invention. God, move over, GMO. <laughs> about playing God at every level. And you know, when I hear Craig Venter, he really thinks he's God. So I started to look at the Green Revolution. I did all the tables. How much were they growing of what? What do they grow today? They were only growing rice and wheat. We did a calculation. If we grew that much rice and wheat on that much land with that much irrigation, with organic and native seeds, would we have less or more? Same. So it wasn't miracle seeds. It was just land grab. Since then, we've been saving biodiversity and calculating the output per acre. It turns out when you intensify biodiversity and in intensify ecological processes, you can double, triple, increase five-fold the nutrition and food output. But this system on which green revolution, biotechnology, synthetic biology are based, don't look at life as Gopal mentioned. All they can see is commodities from a distance. So they've reduced the diversity of the planet to the four commodities that can be patented, genetically engineered. They're barely bringing us two to 3% of the food, that too to unwilling consumers who don't know they're eating GMOs. Yeah. This is not food. It's not a food system. It's a commodity production system, and it's a control system. In the Green Revolution, they couldn't own the plants, but they told us a lie that they had produced high-yielding varieties. There was nothing about the varieties. 
Because if you don't have the chemicals and you don't have the irrigation, they give you nothing. It's zero. The UN at that time said this would be called high response varieties. They're bred for response to chemicals. Now we breed for response to organic. Produces much more under conditions of drought, low water scarcity, marginal soils. But one of the big propaganda items in all discussions of biotechnology is the Green Revolution created a technology to use less land and the biotech revolution will use less land. Now, in the Green Revolution, they increase rice and wheat by expanding the land and meantime getting rid of the basic crops that we were the biggest producers in, pulses and oil seeds. India has introduced the world to pulses, darts. We import darts today. <laughs> now, the US, they're making an eye dart. You know, like an iPhone, iPad, a fake dart. And they really think we are so stupid, put tech against anything and we just say, give it to me, give it to me. Women, the poor women refused to eat it. It was very cheap compared to the price of real dal. Women said, we've got to spend 25 rupees, we'll spend it on something real. This has no taste, it has no flavor. Why should we eat it? It's, it's soya e extrusions, it's called analog dals. Soya shaped into a dal colored yellow. <laughs> and they want to color something, you know, moon will be colored green and urad will be colored black. We are now importing 75% of our pulses and 75% of our oil seeds. No one calculates that, the new import dependency. But the Green Revolution then led to the second Green Revolution, biotechnology. And very often they now qualify it with green biotech. And that's how you get the green corridor. It was proposed as an alternative because by then the critique of the Green Revolution the dependency on toxics was growing. People didn't want it. Its externalities were becoming clear. Punjab, I, when I did my book on the Green Revolution in Punjab, 50% of the soil was already very, very diseased, 10% desertified. The water is disappearing, which is why we have water wars in Punjab. But worse, there's a train that leaves Punjab which has a name called the cancer train. The pesticide and chemical use has led to such explosion of cancer that a train goes from Batinda to Bikaner because in Bikaner the Jains set up a charitable cancer hospital. They can get treated. And as these critics grew, they said, we now have an alternative to chemical use, the life sciences which will get rid of chemicals, which will be able to control pests without spraying pesticides. They introduced a BT cotton into India. I remember it was 98, Monsanto put out huge ads. Saw the ads, I rang up our ministries, so I said, have you given approval? They didn't think they needed approval because in this country they don't need approval. They introduced something called substantial equivalence after the Earth Summit to say we will treat genetically modified organisms as natural organisms. And I call this ontological schizophrenia because the reason they introduced GMOs was to patent life. Because they, and I was in a conversation in 87 where they said, now we can claim we have invented something new. It's a novel organism. We've put a new gene. And then people say, what about biosafety? And say, no, 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 just like nature made it. As if it's like nature made it, how can you claim a pattern? <laughs> but that kind of split mentality is running through the entire narrative of the first green revolution, the second green revolution, and synthetic biology as the third green revolution. What's the result of biotechnology and agriculture in these um, 20 years of commercialization? Before they commercialized, they said, we'll grow food on the moon, in the Sahara Desert, and on toxic dumps. There'll never be food scarcity again. And every trait we'll be able to engineer. All they've managed to engineer is herbicide-resistant. Yeah. 
and Bt toxin traits. None of them have increased yields, a very good study by the Union of Concerned Scientists, failure to yield. They haven't reduced chemical use, they've actually increased it. Because the plants, you know, when you shoot a gene, you make the plant more vulnerable. And when you put the toxic into the plant, the toxic is doing the work and the plant isn't doing its own resilience work. As a result of which, new pests emerge. And as a result of the toxin, the old pest bollworm becomes a super pest. So you've got to spray more and more. In India, 300% increase in non-target species that have become pests, the aphids and the jacids and cotton. The patent means the seed cost jumped 8,000%. 13-fold increase in pesticide use, 1,300% increase in pesticide use. You're talking about an unbelievable jump in the cost of production. Farmers can't pay for it. They're persuaded that these are miracle seeds. And you know, in India, people do believe in miracles. So, and Monsanto will deploy a few gods in the advertising, in a Guru Nanak up in Punjab and uh, Hanumanji down in Andhra Pradesh. People really do believe it is Guru Nanak and Hanuman talking to them. So they took the seeds against the land and when the creditors, who are the sales agent of the seeds and chemicals, come to say, you haven't paid your debt, your land is my land, that day the farmer will go to the field and consume a bottle of pesticide and end his life. And then the widow is told by some neighbor, your husband's lying in the field. That's when she comes to know she's lost the land, she's lost her husband, and they're still in debt. The number of farmer suicides that this process has triggered, according to Indian data from the National Bureau of Crime Records, from between 1995 to 2012, is 284,000 farmers. And this is an underestimate, because this is only the suicides that the police records. It's not the suicides that were attempted, taken to hospital, saved in time. It is not the suicides of the women because they are not treated as farmers. It's not the suicides of the tenants who didn't own the land, but they were tilling it because they too are not treated as farmers. So this is a very small fraction of what's really going on. They're now, of course, coming up with, uh, because it's so obvious biotechnology is not working as we say the GMO emperor has no clothes. There's a lot of clapping going on in spite of it. You remember all the citizens who didn't want to look stupid? And the weavers had said only the intelligent will see the clothes. So I think Nina Fedorov and whoever's the lady who wrote the bioeconomy plan, they're all people pretending to be intelligent. <laughs> because they don't dare to say the emperor has no clothes. And also, by pretending they're seeing brilliant clothes, they are getting loaded with new grants and new jobs and new intellectual property agreements, etc. So now the biggest thing is biofortification. Golden rice is one, they've been trying it from 2000 onwards. When they started, it was going to have only 34 micrograms of vitamin A. I notice you're full of Indian restaurants in this area. <laughs> I'd love to go to uh, a South Indian dosa shop. But, uh, you know, just one little sambar with the curry patta, a little coriander leaves. It's 1,400 in those greens, compared to 34. They've increased the content, I've been told, and even if they double and triple it, they can't reach the levels that biodiversity provides us. So I've called it a blind approach to blindness prevention. And I think the Filipino <laughs> farmers were fully justified in uprooting the trials, because they can see this is wrong. Suddenly, Bill Gates, pushes a GMO banana for saving Indian women from dying in childbirth because of iron deficiency anemia. He's poured 15 million and he wants, in, I mean, the government of India put some more for one scientist. They always have the one heroic scientist, yeah? In this population of seven billion, there's one Kiesley, one Dale, one Craig Winter, as if there were no other scientists, as if no one else had a break. Well, Mr. Dale has done no work on GMO bananas for iron enrichment, but he's already got eight patents. Because ultimately, the game is about patenting life. 
ultimately it is about collecting rents from life's processes. And that's why I'm so very happy the Indian Patent Office just rejected a patent application of Monsanto's on uh, a very broad patent on climate resilience. And uh, because we've had a movement against patents for so long, uh, we had managed to put into our patent laws when they were in amendment an article called 3J, which says living processes, biological processes can't be patented. And unlike your courts, which allowed Monsanto to sue Bauman, our patent office and the appellate authority said, sorry, this is a biological process. The seed makes itself, you don't make it. <laughs> and as far as adding a gene is concerned, that's a known substance. That's not an invention either. Um, the third Green Revolution Synthetic Bio is can only work under the conditions that those who are pushing it repeatedly say in talking about the green economy and talking about the bioeconomy. What they're saying is 75% of the biomass of this world is unutilized. Now if Dave Brower was here, he would say, no, 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 that forest watershed is doing its work. It's not unutilized. It's fully utilized for ecological context. The biomass in third world countries, the women need the grass, they need the fodder. Either nature or people are already using it. 75% is not lying their waste for your exploitation. Second, for you to think it's lying unutilized and for you to think that turning it into raw material into a very highly wasteful process, because part of my work for the last 30 years has been calculating how wasteful and inefficient these systems are. It's always 10 units of input to one unit of output. It's a negative process. And if there wasn't the subsidy with our tax money, it would fall flat on its face as a business without that subsidy. So it necessarily must lead to resource grab and land grab. And therefore, it must lead to resource wars. We see the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But the big on a global scale is the war for biological resources. And it is creating violence at the level of the daily lives of people. Now, I was so happy that at Rio Plus 20, people marched across differences. It didn't happen in Rio. In Rio Plus 20, the farmers, there were no farmers in Rio first Rio, because it, environmental was not treated as an agriculture issue, or agriculture was not treated as an ecological issue. Uh, but everyone marched, just like in Seattle, the, it was the turtles and the teamsters <laughs> marched together. At Rio plus 20, the indigenous people, the peasant organizations, the consumer groups, they all unified on one issue no to the green economy. So they couldn't get it into the Rio Plus 20 declaration in the way they had wanted to. They would have liked to be, have 20 years after Rio be their constitution for the resource grab. And just like we've been able to stop them with that legitimacy, the reason I'm here is to give you full support to keep, to have a really green corridor. And we know what the color green is. Thank you. So I wanted to start, um, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna jump around a little because there are so many different exciting pieces, but one of the first things that you said and something that's very important, um, I think for us here is, um, is this notion of bad science, the good science and the bad science. We're in this position where um, so a huge impact on the local economy is actually the university and the labs they, we think of them as being in Berkeley or uh, being in Livermore, but they're a huge economic driver and economic engine in the economy here. And there is this, there is this notion that because it's, they keep calling it basic science. Jay Kiesling's work is supposedly all in basic science, but really it's all in commercialization. 
So I want you to talk a little bit about the trends that you're seeing in, um, in science and in the, in the academies and in these institutions, but also more importantly, what's the good science? What's the science we're looking for? How do we, how do we talk about the, the you know, is it, is it that the all science is bad or is it really just about the commandeering of the institution by these corporate interests? And for you as a scientist to speak a little bit to that and your methodology and your work. Bad science is when the search for knowledge gets compromised for, by greed. And um, bad science has been the result of, uh, of pressure from the military industrial complex. We, you know, it's not that it's happening for the first time. Um, but, but bad science has become particularly bad uh, with with two new trends. One is uh, the genetic engineering trend and the other is the geoengineering trend. Um, and when money comes first and money making comes first and you can make money through lies, then propaganda replaces science and knowledge. There's another element to this. We are in 2013. And by the, you know, in 2013, we've had so much increase in ecological knowledge of the interconnectedness of systems. So much more knowledge of the fragility of the ecological web of life. All that knowledge is there. Real scientists develop that knowledge. Real scientists like Ignacio give us more knowledge about how soil as a living system actually works. Uh, epigenetics, that to me is basic science. That how genes express depends on the context in which they are part. And something, and it's not just about living systems, that's what my PhD was about, you know. Quantum theory teaches you non-separability. It teaches you that measurement depends on context. All these issues are known. For the last 100 years in physics, definitely for the last 50 years and more in biology. Most important concepts of good science and biology, that living systems are self-organized. And what all of these technologies are using is a very outmoded assumption that has no place in science anymore. It worked for the early days of industrialism. But it was bad science even then. When Bacon talks about raping nature to know her better, it was bad science. <laughs> Partnership with nature would have been the good science. Um, when uh, Boyle says the reverence with which in, in the native Indians hold nature is an impediment in progress. That's bad science. Uh, so when there was, you know, at that point there was a marriage of commerce with knowledge. And knowledge with power, as Bacon said, started then, we got reductionist mechanistic science, but it is really silly in today's world. You know, that time they were doing it right in colonialism. You could trash the third world, you could trash the peasants, tribals were primitive. Today, they're pushing mechanistic assumptions at a time when real science has shown that they don't work. The world is not a machine. So for me, good science is a science practiced with a deep love for knowledge, with a deep respect for nature, with a deep sense of science being a public good, and therefore needing to stand on social and ecological responsibility. The problem with all of the technologies that are now posed, they, they are not technology, science. Genetic engineering is not science. You don't even know where you're shooting that gene. You have no idea what it does to the genome. Elena who was working with you. I mean, she showed us in Mexico when we were there together, how the next generation of plants are all monsters. 
we were told, you know, Dolly was supposed to be this big new world, the creator and the created, Ian Woolmert and the sheep, Dolly. The young people won't remember, you know, it's a bit old. <laughs> but, you know, Newsweek, Time, identical cover story, the creator and the creative. Dolly was supposed to launch a whole new brave world. The clone was from a genetically engineered sheep. There were 372 other clones. They were all monsters. Some didn't have eyes, some didn't have ears. They wanted to then sell that as mincemeat. Dolly herself didn't survive. She's now in a museum. So if we start, I mean, one of the books that hasn't been written are the failed promises, you know? And we have such a huge list. Yeah, we have Flavor Saver, Herman the Bull. I mean, they kept creating. Herman the Bull was supposed to have first given us human milk because they put a human gene. And the cows bred from Herman would give us human milk. Because we've had such a strong, you know, baby food movement who fought the Nestle's of the world. When they came up with this human milk, they said, nonsense. You know, this is worse than Nestle's baby powder. <laughs> Overnight, they changed. Overnight, it became a cure for AIDS. Nobody knows where Herman is anymore. And I think we must do a recall of all the failed promises, because a lot of innocent people invest in this rubbish, because they don't know the history yeah. of repeated failures. Yeah. I think that actually, not just the people who invest, but the, the way for us here, the way in which um, the biotech, the promises are presented in such a way that they actually appeal, like we're in the Brower Center, we see ourselves as the epicenter of the environmental movement. And so the way the biotech industry paints itself here in the Bay Area, for example, is we're going to clean up oil spills, we're going to get, up off, get us off of fossil fuels, we're going you know, to save the world from, from the oil companies, even though they're deeply invested in the process. But when you go to New Orleans and you look at the bio district development in New Orleans, they can't go after the oil industry and environment, so they tell everybody it's going to be health. And that they're gonna they're gonna make everybody yeah. healthy. So it's this it is those promises, and they're very parallel to the promises that are made in the global south. So another way that it's sold here is we're gonna we're gonna cure malaria by being able, able to create the entire world supply of artemisinin. And what's really happening, of course, is that small farmers who grow sweet wormwood will be displaced off their lands. Which um, which I'd like to um, ask you to kind of. Um, talk a little bit more about the land grabs. We're, with the biotech field, we're seeing, and there's two kinds of land grabs happening in the global south, and then a whole other kind happening here. But um, there's, there's the land grab in the form of, um, we are gonna take more land for sugarcane production in Brazil as the feedstock to feed these um, never before existed in nature microbes that we digitally encoded with new genetic information, quote unquote information. Um, so that's one kind of land grab that's happening. But then there's the other, which is all of the things they say they're going to do are already done by people in the global south, much better, much more effectively. So we're going to have natural, quote unquote, vanilla made by microbes, and that's gonna wipe out vanilla farmers and agroecological crop. So if you can talk a little bit about how, the, how you're seeing the land grab issue play out, what the resistance to that is looking like in the global south, and then maybe we'll come back to what that looks like here. Well, you know, in India, they tried to divert, I think it was 11 million hectares for biofuel. And some places, they would just appropriate farmers' land to grow the biofuel. And other places, they enclose the commons. That biofuel project is failed. It was based on Jatropa. A lot of the African land grab is also based on Jatropa. Uh, it's millions and millions of acres. What this land grab does is two things. First, communities that are producing, not just their food, but their fiber, their fuel, uh, it, does, you know, it, it doesn't get counted. When I talk about monocultures of the mind, part 
or what I want to refer to is the disappearance of the local and the disappearance of diversity. And all of the production capacity of ecosystems and people's economies doesn't get counted. It also doesn't get counted because of the way growth is measured, which is why the Green Corridor using growth, which is another obsolete term. You know, the chemicals in agriculture came from the war. Growth as a category came from the war. Because they had to mobilize finances for military processes. So they worked out the system of national accounting based on GDP. And GDP doesn't count as production, that which you produce for yourself. When you produce what you consume, you don't produce. That's the definition. So a forest working to maintain an ecosystem doesn't produce. A community that grows its wheat and processes it and mills it and does a bakery, there's real food out there, there's real work in those economies, but it doesn't get counted. So ultimately, growth only measures the destruction of nature and people's economies to convert it into commodities and cash. So far, it's been done in some sectors here and there. What the bioeconomy would like to do is do it across the planet on a global scale. And to do it with the empowerment of two things. One is violent invasion. And the second is the power of money. Both of them are illegitimate because people have existed on these lands and taken care of them. And to count them as not existing and the economies are not existing is going back to that old colonial category of terra nullius. You remember when the colonialism started, the, they created a jurisprudence of empty lands. If lands were not occupied by white people and ruled by white Christian princes, it was empty. So this land was empty because you know, these Native Americans weren't white. They were red Indians. Our land was empty, Australia was empty. And in a way what they're doing is with, they're combining a terra nullius with a bio nullius. Hmm. That it's all empty till we right. do something to it. That's right. One of the things that we've been talking about is this, you know, even in our, in our progressive movements, we talk about the limits of growth. We talk about um, you know, you can't have endless growth on a fl finite planet. But I think one of the things that we're actually missing in that is that every, every bit of the planet is, is in use. And so growth inherently leads to a paucity of diversity. It has to convert what is already being used and what already exists into something else. So growth by definition will erode diversity. It has to because there's yeah. nothing that isn't being used, used. Yeah. by so nature every, or people yeah. by nature or people so it must take land it must take culture yeah. growth will always erode diversity and it will create poverty yes because there's such a tiny proportion of people who make a living in the global economy even tinier proportion who hang around in wall street and play the casino and the real economies are economies where local biodiversity provides for local needs. So I call these biodiversity economies. That's right. By appropriating this, these biological resources, you basically deprive local people, which is why the first movement I got involved in was, was Shipko, you know, the Hug the Tree movement. Oh, because commercial forestry was taking away. Tree huggers. <laughs> the commercial forestry was robbing the local communities of their food and fodder and the ability of the ecosystems to provide. So, you know, I work very closely with the Bhutan government, mm -hmm. and the king has appointed a 60-member group to redefine development. And Bhutan has had such vision. Like way back, the king said, I am not going to chase GDP, the gross domestic product. I will evolve the principle of gross national happiness and well-being. And that's what mm -hmm. Bhutan's Ministry of Planning is the GNH ministry. It's not a growth ministry. And I think we need to learn more from these initiatives where we are getting, I mean, and the point is these are, 
These were wrong categories created in a military situation and they're perpetuating a military context and not allowing an earth democracy to be created. Something that you said um, in, your, in your opening um, remarks was um, one of the ways the land was taken. You haven't paid your debt, your land is my land, and I immediately jumped into my head, oh yeah, that's uh, the 2008 housing crisis. Um, and um, you know, the model, we invented the model <laughs> and, um, and, and uh, put it all over the world. But it does speak in some ways to one of the big challenges that we have around the way development is um, is promoted here, which is um, there's a job. Pe people need jobs. People, there is a housing crisis. There is an economic crisis in, in the United States, and actually even in the Bay Area, um, despite, uh, despite Berkeley property values, not everybody uh, lives well in the Bay Area. Um, and so a lot of this um, development happens as a justification for, um, for jobs. In the end, it's very similar. It's exactly what you said, that when you evaluate it, it's a couple Can hundred. Can the mic so folks outside can hear? Oh, sorry. I thought I was, sorry. Apparently, I'm not talking in the mic and you can't hear me outside. Sorry, it was a joke. Um, so, but the jobs that are being created, what we can see is that the jobs are actually the, a couple of hundred actually high-tech uh, research and development jobs and there's no, um, there's no peripheral or, or other economy happening. And in the same token, of course, there's the erosion of livelihoods in the global south. And um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the kinds of connections um, that are being made, the, the taking of land, the displacement of people in the urban centers, what you're seeing in the global south, and then how we can all, how we can link these struggles better one of the things that we're finding is it's how do we address the social conditions of people here, provide the, the jobs and the economy, without it, for those of us who are looking up and looking around, without it leading to um, the catastrophic erosion of livelihoods and biodiversity on the rest of the planet. And I don't know if you have to use this too. No, I think, I think I'm fine. I think you're fine. I can hear myself. I don't know why I was giving yeah. this. Um, I don't know if you remember, Jerry, one of the days when we were sort of fictionalizing the world with total corporate takeover and the public system and the public sectors destroyed, uh, projecting from the rates at which people are laid off to increase pro profitability, uh, projecting the way um, these are not, you know, it's, it's basically jobless growth. We had worked out a 3% figure, I remember, in one of our IFG meetings, that at best, if global corporations control the world and control all the resources of the planet, they'll only be able to offer jobs for 3%. And that, while destroying other work. And they've worked out a very clever thing, that if you don't get into that 3%, you are the failure. You know, Tom Friedman keeps writing about that. You know, you Americans, you pathetic Americans, catch up with the Indians and the Chinese. We don't have to catch up with the Indians. We're down to 4% growth anyway. And India is not shiny anymore. And a rupee is down to 68 rupee to a dollar. Uh, because none of these miracles last. None of these bubbles survive. I think any future real, a real living economy has to be based on caring for the planet, rejuvenating resources, and sustaining the resources as the commons. That's the first. Because if the planet doesn't have the resources, we don't meet our needs. Uh, and that's where a lot of work can be created, must be created. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, I came through Italy and because we have a whole program there, and, you know, Jerry's part of the International Commission on the Future of Food, but we have a Navdanya uh, program and uh, many of the regions, you know, work with Navdanya to evolve their policies, especially in this time of total economic slowdown and collapse and austerity and everything else. And the region Emilia Romagna, from where you get the Parmesan cheese, um, you know, they've worked out an amazing system 
at the time when they were doing jobs, it said, anyone unemployed, we will give work to protect the land and rejuvenate the landscape and rejuvenate the territory. And that's where they're putting their effort. And then there's food that comes out of it. They're making sure the local economy absorbs that food through school programs, hospitals, etc. I think the word jobs is like the word growth. That's right. You know, job was right. created in the Industrial Revolution when they destroyed a livelihood and gave you a job to take home. You know, it was called peace job. Go home and stitch this garment and bring it back. What we need is creative work. And we need to reclaim the capacity to do creative work through the rights to resources and the recovery of the commons. But more importantly, we need to bring back the discussion on the right for meaningful work. It's a fundamental right. And all the discussion about you know, the right to work, workers' security, workers' rights, as being an interference in growth, um, it's, it's a whole new liberal myth. And it works to create this situation. So the, the project of this fake green, let's call it, yeah, the fake green project, can only work by trashing the planet and trashing society. And it'll get trashed itself eventually. But they don't see it. That's the stupidity. That that kind of empire cannot last. That's right. That's right. Um, so where do you see the most exciting and vibrant or just exam examples of some and of them? Uh, oh. Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh. <laughs> it's really quite something. Um, where do you see in uh, all over the world, north and south, what are some of the most inspiring um, social movement work that you see happening in um, things that are really like building power at the local level and remaking economy in ways that can hold communities and hold people? I know, of course, the work that, um, that's happening with, with SEED um, all over the world, but particularly in India, but what are some of the other things that you're seeing and what are some of the lessons that you think we can take here as we're as here in the belly of the beast, where our job is to implode the empire, um, what are some of the lessons and tools that we can uh, that we can we can take? I find some of the very very exciting work that's being done is is by looking honestly at systems, you know, farming systems, and then realizing that small farmers are actually the backbone of food security. They provide 72% of the food. When you measure commodities, they don't count. But when you measure food, they are the primary reason that we get food. And so the 28% is industrial farms, but GM corn and soya is less than 5 and 10%. So when you start to really look honestly at systems, you then find the solutions do come from the earth and people. Yeah? Uh, the second thing that I think is very exciting to me is how there's a deep convergence between um, new, new ecological knowledge, good science, and traditional knowledge. So, you know, in, in Navdanya, we, we adopt traditional practices, 20 kinds of indigenous composting methods. And by the way, composting was spread to the world by Albert Howard, who came to India uh, uh, as an imperial economic botanist um, to bring in chemicals, etc. And he says, I didn't find pests. I don't find the soil lacking in fertility. So he decided, as he says in his book, Agricultural Testament, I decided to make the Indian peasant and the pest my professors. And then he wrote the book, The Agricultural Testament. Uh, out of which sort of, you know, Rodale grew and uh, the Soil Association in the U.S., etc. grew. Uh, those practices that have been around, we now have new ability, <coughs> for example, to look at the soil in its living systems. Without the microscope, we couldn't. Without years of studies by soil ecologists like Ignacio, we didn't have the capacity to look at the interactions. Now we do. And Every practice gets validated by ecological science. Mm -hmm. uh, 
On the one side, you've got bad science and failing technologies parading a science. On the other side, you've got all of people's knowledge and the new em emerging ecological science giving us the real answers. And the real answers show us that contrary to what is claimed, you know, you, you've got a project where the whole planet is needed to run five companies for a handful of people to push products that nobody wants through subsidies <laughs> and denial of the right to know. On the other hand, you've got systems which use very few resources. You know, you shrink your footprint, but you enlarge your output. But most importantly, you enlarge your solidarity, both with the Earth and her beings, as well as with the human community. And quite clearly, uh, you know, which path we should evolve towards is so clear. All we have to deal with are the lies, the collusion between the state and its military power and its financial power, and these emperors with no clothes, um, and have the capacity to both speak the truth and defend our commons. So, um, thank you. <laughs> yes, and, um, <laughs> yes, and while, um, while I think, mo I think most people are, uh, realize that something is not right. And in fact, actually in the US, we as a movement, we've done a very good job of describing the problem. But one of the, one of the challenges is that our solutions seem to not add up. So um, at Movement Generation, we're fond of saying the scale of the problem does not dictate the scale of the solutions. But that doesn't mean that the scale of solutions shouldn't add up. So one of the challenges that we face all the time and one of the, 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 the questions that we're, we're called on to answer is, how does all this local economy, living right with the land, add up to dealing with, quote unquote, global warming or, quote unquote, um, you know, climate change? All of the things, all of the global scale problems that are described. And this is what... This is the, um, these are the lies. This is the, this is the arsenal of, for example, the biotech companies. That they, their, their weapon is the weapon of scale. Um, that they say they can, they can do the whole thing in one shot. It's what the geoengineers promise. It's what the biotech companies promise. So how do we, what's your um, response to that sort of challenge around the questions of scale and, and. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the issue of scale um, also comes from a, a kind of blindness to see that multiples of the small can be bigger than one giant. And let me give you a simple example for this. Um, you know, when, when I heard the biotech industry talk about their vision of the future, GMOs, patents, TRIPS, GATT, WTO, and that's the day I said, this is so wrong, uh, but how do I deal with it? And to my mind came Gandhi pulling out a spinning wheel and starting to spin cloth at a time where textiles, you know, what your green corridor is to become is the equivalent of the Manchester and Lancashire of that time. And we were told that everything happened because of Manchester. It was a miracle, industrialism, etc. The reality was people were captured in Africa, brought here as slaves mm -hmm. to cultivate cotton. Right. Indian farmers were forced to grow indigo for their textile industry. And something that you wouldn't have to be taught, but we were taught in our history books, are master weavers, because they continue to weave better muslin than the factories in Lancashire and Mantra. Their thumbs were cut, so they couldn't teach the next generation. Oh. They couldn't weave. So we've have this kind of violence to destroy the alternative colonize. Gandhi took out a spinning wheel and everyone laughed at him and said, how do you think some pieces of wood can bring you freedom? Because of the issue of scale. And his response is what has inspired me to start Navdanya and Seed Saving. He said, only this can, because a spinning wheel is so small that it can be in the hands of the last person. And being in the hands of the last person 
the poorest of women in the smallest of huts can be part of the freedom movement. So the multiplication capacity of the small is what made it large. Whereas the bigness of the big is what makes it small. What we are talking about is the smallness of five biotech companies controlling seed. Like I said, two or three guys, you know, they're all strange fellows, you know. Personality-wise, they look, you know, they have a problem. Yeah. You know, and I'll tell you the two things, maybe definitely, you know. I notice your next discussion is on biosafety on 16th October. 16th October is World Food Day. Monsanto's given itself the award for feeding the world this year, the World Food Prize. Uh, it's the period, 2nd October, Gandhi's birth anniversary to 16th October, World Food Day. We celebrate. We've been celebrating for years, but now we celebrate it as the fortnight of seed freedom and food freedom. Mm -hmm. 2nd October, to say no to every unjust policy plan and law. And you should have a little bonfire of that bioeconomy. That's right. That's right. And for anyone who says this is wireless, remind them Gandhi had bonfires of British clothing. It was part of his non-violent, non-cooperation. Um, 16th October, we decided, you know, okay, Monsanto gives itself the World Food Prize. We've got food heroes everywhere. Let us honor them. Let's find the food heroes. And I think in this area, you have so many. Absolutely. So, you know, go to the seedfreedom.in website and put up the heroes. We need four categories. Yeah? The farmers, the gardeners, the good cafe. <laughs> we need the good scientists in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes local governments who make good decisions. And I'm thinking next year, while we are having this conversation, mine's, mine's going to, you know, this will be the, the wall of real heroes. Hmm. And then we must move to a wall of those silly clappers, <laughs> yeah, who clap for themselves or clap for whatever. Um, and we need a category of the researchers. We need a category of government decision makers. We definitely need a category of media spin mm -hmm. people. Uh, and we need a category for the fake organization they float. I've just been told, because I go to Seattle tomorrow, that to counter, you know, they counter the California vote on GMO labeling by pouring 40 billion, million and mm -hmm. doing false advertising. They've just created, we're sitting in the building of Dave Brown, who started Friends of the Earth. They've started for the no to the proposition on lower labeling. Guess what they've started? You will never guess. <laughs> Friends of Forests and Farms wow. is the biotech industry's front wow. Wow. on why GM apples, GMV, GM salmon is vital for the forests and farms of Washington State. Wow. 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 That's disturbing. So, um, if the... <laughs> why, why, why do you need the mic? Um, so, if the truth is so evident, why is it that when um, a couple of biohackers um, uh, from, the, from the Bay throw up a Kickstarter campaign to promise everybody that they're going to make plants out of glowing, you know, glowing plants from um, synthetic biology derived seeds, that, and they set a you know Kickstarter target for sixty thousand dollars. They get uh, nearly half a million dollars of people who are actually investing in trying to and what will now what will be the largest release unregulated release the first ever release completely unregulated of genetically engineered organisms. Why is it that in the U.S. What do you think is at the heart of why? we are particularly susceptible to the, uh, in, in the, in the broadest sense, to the stupidity of, um, of the industry. Is it, you know, I, I have my own opinions, <laughs> but we, are all, we all came to hear yours. I'd like to hear yours, too. <laughs> I think one is the illusion that somehow America became what it did uh, what it has become 
because of technology. Um, how it colonized the land and how it's continuing to dominate the world through violence is, is ne not part of the, the narrative. So, and, you know, nobody studies this issue more than Jerry does, the technology myth as a driver. So all you have to do is offer something as cutting-edge technology. It could be stupid, it could be dangerous, it could be irresponsible, it could be futile. I mean, the golden rice is a futile experiment. But it'll get pushed because it's sold as a technology. Um, so in a way, the myth of America is based on the technology myth. The second is separation. People are so alienated that um, a spin like this, you know, glowing plants, a person who's relating to plants and relating to the sunlight and relating to other things will not get charmed by glowing plants. <laughs> but if, you know, if all you're doing is sitting in front of your computer and betting on other people's money or writing software for Mr. So Microsoft, um, you know, you, you get excited. <laughs> I think that, that gets it, for us, that gets at the heart. I will share my opinion. That, that gets at the heart of, uh, of something that, we've, that we say and very much inspired by your work and the work of the millions of farmers and indigenous peoples and, um, and communities engaged in struggle around the world, which is this idea that place is land plus language, it's seed plus um, it's, it's soil plus story, but what makes home is land plus language plus love, and um, you know soil plus story plus sacredness, mm -hmm. and the fact that we have paved over the possibility of a relationship to place has you know it's the cognitive concrete, and we're 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 quite clear that you have to break the real concrete and get at the real soil if you want to break the cognitive concrete and get at the real love of place. <laughs> And, um, and so it is, it is actually, you know, we have paved over the possibility of seeing something better simply because we've paved over place. So that's, that's why we think people put money into glowing plants, even though it's <laughs> stupid and will never happen. And lots of money will be made off of it anyway. Um, I should check the time. It's the perfect time for me to give you the opportunity to make a final uh, um, statement or comment, I would really love for you to speak a little bit more about um, the week of the, the actions, the fortnight of actions that are coming up. Um, there are many folks in this room, I've, I've seen Planting Justice and Fat Beats and Urban Tilth and many grassroots organizations here that are engaged in transforming the food system um, that I think would be very inspired to engage in that. And then and a call on all of us to think about how we can connect our own resilience and, um, and, um, <coughs> and local living and loving economy with an actual confrontation against what we know is in the way, which is these kinds of false solutions promoted through things like the Green Corridor and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. So if you can speak a little bit about the call to action for us. Oh, I, I don't need to, it. You don't need that. <laughs> I'm the only one who needs that for some reason. <laughs> so, you know, I am so very inspired by uh, young people everywhere turning to basics, you know? The, the model of development is a line of progress like this. Agriculture, industry, service economies, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. Um, as if we, there'll be a day we won't need agriculture. Um, and young people recognize that not only do you need the love of place and the identity of place, you need good food. Because the system that's evolving has no capacity to provide food. I call it the soil and green model of food. <laughs> that's right. Because that's where it'll end, you know. A film that was made about how in a highly divided society, you know, some in control and the rest are workers, and as they die, they're ground up into a greeny thing. There too, it is green. That's right. <laughs> so I <I'm> green. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and turning to basics becomes very important for two reasons. One, 
that it is the place where you start rebuilding local and living economies and local and loving economies. Because you can't build locally without love. You can conquer in a distance with hate and fear. But to build locally, you have to hang together as human community, but also as an earth community. The fortnight of action, as I mentioned, is 2nd October to 16th October. Uh, our overall larger call is seeds of freedom, gardens of hope. As long as we can save the seeds of freedom, both the real seeds that are free to reproduce, that farmers are free to see, save, um, that those seeds are the place where we start rebuilding the food system. And gardens of hope because A, people are losing hope and we need to cultivate hope. How do you cultivate hope? Cultivating a garden is such a good place to begin. Um, also gardens of hope because the economic crisis It's a very major part of what we face. And even though things like the Green Corridor are being offered as a solution to the crisis, it will just aggravate it and deepen it because it will deepen the processes that have caused the economic crisis. The lovely thing about starting to create local economies, beginning with the seed, going into the gardens, farms, is that it isn't just in the food system you create creative work. You start creating creative work with everything else. There will be communities of researchers. There will be teachers. There'll be new schools. There will be the bakers. You know, there's a wonderful breeder in uh, Washington State, and Ignacia and I were with them in, when I was teaching at Eugene two years ago. Uh, Steve, Steve, it's Steve? Steve Jones. Steve Jones. He's breeding old varieties. He has found bakers to use them. He's finding old mills to re resurrect. S Salvatore Ceccarelli, who does participatory breeding with us, and is, you know, we're, we're running a, a month-long course on the A to Z of agroecology and organic farming, and we'll, we repeat it every year. And I hope some of you will come next year, but Salvatore Ceccarelli teaches the seed section with me uh, he does the participatory breeding part. In Iran, he introduced old wheats, bread with farmers. A baker just started to use it. It turns out the breads that people were buying got rid of so many of the allergies, including gluten allergies, that people were having. He's having a booming business, the baker. And people love it. So the myth that, you know, it's... After all, it's a very colonial myth, right? right? You and I are supposed to be somehow inferior because we're brown. Yeah? Native seeds are supposed to be inferior because they're native. But there's, in fact, not only is there nothing wrong with them, they're the only potential for evolving into the future because they're the only ones that have the resilience and adaptive capacity to evolve. The entire structure, the entire knowledge structure and the entire property structure is based on creating uniformity. All of the breeder right law are based on DUS, distinctiveness, uniformity, stability. We've just drafted a law of the seed according to the seed and the earth. You know, how does the seed really function? It doesn't function with uniformity, it functions with diversity. It doesn't function for putting container ships for Cargill of corn and soya, some of it going for biofuel, some of it going for animal feed. Quality matters. And finally, resilience. <clears throat> this system has zero resilience. And it'll take one little financial crisis, one climate catastrophe, one social upheaval for it to collapse. Resilience is both the ecological resilience in our biodiversity, our seeds, but the social resilience of communities cooperating with each other to be able to tide every kind of disaster that we are facing and will increasingly face. 
because that is the con situation in which we live. And the reason we call for this fortnight of action is because I feel so deeply, uh, both, both through analysis and through applying the mind, but also through intuition, that um, we, we have a very urgent choice between extinction and survival. And survival was always made to look inferior. And <laughs> tendencies for extinction were celebrated. And that's why the rule of stupidity. That's right. And we need to put survival and sustenance at the center of how we think, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to the earth. Survival is not a bad idea. <laughs> you go this evening. Um, the first is that on October 16th, um, another amazing um, warrior who has um, really led the fight for workers' rights and health and safety around the biotech um, uh, industry, um, Becky McLean, who won um, a suit against Pfizer as a whistleblower, um, will be here in conversation with me and also Ed Hammond, and that will be a fun conversation as well, and I encourage you all to come back for that. Um, I also want to, um, so we passed the hat at the beginning, and now you know it was worth it. So we're going to pass the hat again. <laughs> um, so if there are hats around, pass them please. Um, and uh, my folks who are here, you guys can help us out. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that it is, um, you know, it is by principle that these are always free and open to the public, and we recognize that the venue is small, but it also allows for an intimate conversation. And finally, I want to say that um, you can learn more about all of us at symbiowatch.org, and um, it is with the leadership of the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology, which is an entirely all-volunteer project um, that this series was started and put together, and it is Tina Stevens and uh, the rest of the Alliance for Human Biotechnology that has consistently done the heavy lifting. So I think it's really important that we, um, that we acknowledge those who do the work. So thank you very much. <laughs>